All right, everybody. So today we're going to do just a, a video lesson. I'm going to try and keep it brief. And if you need to pause it to fill in any notes as you go, um, feel free to do that. I'm just going to kind of roll through it. Um, that way we keep this video on the shorter side. I'm going to give you guys a little vocab to do today, and then hopefully you can enjoy the rest of the day. All right, so this chapter, chapter 17, is going to be focused on the atmosphere. If I covered this yesterday, then go ahead and fast forward the video. We all stopped in a different spot yesterday. All right, so the atmosphere, basic definition, is the envelope of gases that surround our planet. And those gases would be, you know, air, a, a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, um, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, like so many different gases. Anything you can think of that you've heard in gases form makes up some portion of the atmosphere. But the key to our nitrogen at 78% and oxygen at 21%. So right up here, I'm going to put 78. And then right here, 21. Everything else makes up some portion of the last 1%. Um, so that's a theme we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but right now, why the atmosphere? Why on a rainy day, do we need to sit around and talk about the atmosphere? Well, for starters, the precipitation that, that fell this morning or is falling today um, is a result of the atmosphere, right? Water vapor um, condensed into clouds and then fell today in the um, form of rain. Um, but we also need the atmosphere for oxygen so that our bodies can um, use the oxygen other animals can use the oxygen for cellular respiration. And when we say metabolism, um, that means that we're breaking down chemical energy. We're changing it um, into a different form. Um, photosynthesis from plants, right? Plants take the carbon dioxide and convert it into um, chemical energy, which then we eventually use. Um, it also shields us from dangerous UV radiation, which is why we need to wear our sunblock when we go outside because there's always a little bit of UV. That's what's actually helping to tan your skin. Um, another day, maybe we'll talk about the different types of UV that make it through. Um, and then, you know, the birds, right? A, a, a bird or, or an airplane can't just fly through nothing, right? So there, there is a medium there and that medium is the, the gases or the air. Um, and then lastly, um, the atmosphere unleashes violent storms, so we will spend some time talking about different storms, like thunderstorms and hurricanes. Um, all fun topics, actually. So, I'm going to move right along. We are the caretakers of the Earth. We are the caretakers of the atmosphere. And they actually realized a number of years ago that we were not doing a very good job. Right In manufacturing, we were using these things called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. Um, we were using them in aerosols, and um, we were using them as propellants. We were using them for um, or in the condensers of air conditioning units. But these gases were getting into the atmosphere. They were actually going up there, breaking apart, and the radicals, um, we're breaking apart the ozone layer. Um, so losing the ozone layer, then lost that, that point that we just had up there. Um, the, the ozone layer is going to protect us from the UV. Now we created these holes and more UV was coming in, causing cancers and other problems. So the positive side is the hole in the ozone layer is now concentrated down over Antarctica and the hole is getting smaller. So we must be doing something right. Um, atmospheric composition, as I said before, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, muy importante. Um, I would actually write in, I believe I gave you a spot in your notes to write in the word oxygen. And then 1% 
other. Now of that 1%, argon is the most abundant. And then from there, everything else breaks down. So if you look in the little diagram over here, you can see nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and then everything else is considered a trace gas. So this whole column over here, all trace gases. And that's why when we talk about the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, um, I didn't look it up this morning, but I believe it's somewhere around um, 413 parts per million, right? That seems like a very insignificant number, but you need to look at the trend, right? Pre-industrial revolution, um, we were looking at about 287 parts per million, and we've had an increase of over 100 parts per million in a very short period of time. Um, why is this significant? Why, why am I spending time on it? Carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane are all greenhouse gases. They're all in the atmosphere trapping um, long wave radiation from leaving the earth and thus heating our earth, which is a good thing, right? Let's not, let, let's not be mistaken. We need carbon dioxide in our atmosphere in order for Earth to be habitable. Without it, the global temperature would be about 33 degrees Celsius cooler, right? Without the greenhouse gases. Um, and I'm about y'all, but that would be really cold. Um, that would be no beach time. That would mean really bad winters. But too much of anything's a bad thing. And so as we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, as that number continues to climb, um, the amount of heat being trapped in the atmosphere will continue to increase. And that's where the global warming and climate change come into the conversation. All right, sorry, if you get me talking on those topics, I could talk all day. But uh, some trace gases play a key role in controlling atmospheric temperature, as I just made mention of. Um, but one of those is actually water vapor, right? So it, I want you guys to think for, for a second. On a cloudy day, what are the temperatures normally like? If you go outside today, um, is a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler than yesterday when the sun was able to pierce through and warm the earth. But on the flip side, think about in the summer, and you might have to wait until the summertime to really experience this. If we have a nice, clear, sunny day, sun's rays are hitting down, we have a nice warm day, and then clouds come in, that night, we're actually going to have a warmer night because the outgoing radiation is going to be trapped or, or insulated by the cloud cover, right? The water vapor is actually trapping it and um, causing the atmosphere to temporarily be a little bit warmer. On the, the flip side, if we have a cloudy day and then a nice clear night, we actually get really cool temperatures. So during the day, we were blocking out the sun's rays from, or the, the we, we were blocking or limiting the sun's rays from coming in to begin with, and then the outgoing waves at night on a clear night um, are just escaping. So be thinking about this, but never use water vapor as an argument against climate change. Um, water vapor in our atmosphere is pretty much a fixed number. That, that's that been pretty consistent for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. All right, I digress. Um, getting back to this, we have water in the atmosphere in all three states. So we have the gaseous state um, or water vapor. Um, this is the result of condensation. Then we have liquid water in the form of clouds. Remember that clouds form from condensation. As well as solid ice crystals. Up in the clouds, we can actually have really high altitude clouds called cirrus clouds. They can have little tiny ice crystals. We can also have snow and hail falling from the sky, right, in forms of precipitation. That's also going to be your solids.
Now, as I just mentioned, clouds, collection of tiny droplets of water or ice, not gas. Can't say that enough, not gas. And clouds tend to be at varying levels. We talked about this a little at the beginning of the year with the idea that you have your high altitude clouds called the cirrus, cirrostratus, cirrocumulus. Then you have your middle altitude clouds, your alto cumulus, alto stratus, your clouds of vertical development, the ones that have that can go all the way up, um, which are your cumulonimbus, those are the heavy storm clouds. And then when you get down to the low altitude clouds, like your stratus cloud and your cumulus cloud, right, we're pretty close to the ground. But the ones closest to the ground, nearly touching the ground, the ones that you guys can, can walk through, or the ones that are actually physically touching the ground, um, are called fog. And you guys might see fog. I think it's a little more common in the, the fall and the spring. Um, but even out over the water, if any of you guys like to, to fish early in the morning, um, sometimes there's some, some good clouds that, that roll in where you can't see your hand in front of you. And we'll talk about fog and clouds a little bit later. But just want to give you a, a quick interlude. All right. Um, so the in, in order for clouds to form, you actually need a, a, a surface for the water to condense on called the condensation nuclei. And condensation nuclei bring up the, the idea of an atmospheric aerosol. So I've just given you a lot that's not in the notes, but rather um, want to develop the conversation a little. Because otherwise you're like, okay, so why do I care about aerosols? Because they're, they're a key component for these other processes. So atmospheric aerosols, tiny little particles that are suspended in the air. And these tiny little particles can, can vary from different sources, right? Volcanic ash, right? Big volcanic eruption throws all kinds of ash and eject it out into the atmosphere. Um, that ash can work as a condensation nuclei. It can also block out incoming solar radiation. Right, so radiation from the sun can hit those little aerosols and the aerosol actually absorbs it and then we have lower temperatures as a result. Um, you can have salts and sulfates um, from sea spray. So if you've ever been out on a boat zipping around on your jet ski or on somebody's boat that's moving a little bit faster, um, you might notice as the day goes on that you start to develop a little bit of like a, a white um, powder on your skin. Um, some people have actually, if they don't moisten their eyes, they can actually affect their eyes from a lot of that salt spray. Um, so that's another example of an aerosol, right? Getting the little salt particles up there. Um, inorganic, things like, like dust or soot. Um, soot down here, we're talking about wildfires, um, even your, your chimney, right? Maybe you see a neighbor's chimney is backing up and they, it's puffing out a lot of black um, smoke. Um, that, that black smoke is soot. Um, Mary Poppins, right? If you've ever seen the they film Mary Poppins, um, the chimney sweepers, right? They're all like covered in, in this black film. That's all soot. And then for those of us with allergies, we certainly want to be concerned about the organic aerosols like pollen, bacteria, mold. Oh, and hey, viruses. Hmm, too soon, too soon. All right. Um, so all these aerosols get pumped into the, the atmosphere. A lot of them get washed out during um, precipitation, right? And we're going to see where some of those go. Um, so atmospheric aerosols, uh, concentrations vary with location. Um, when you're over the land, you're going to get a lot more of the organic, right? The pollen, the bacteria, um, the volcanic ash and dust. If you're out over the ocean, then I would expect to get more of the um, sol salts and the sulfates. Now, some things I... 
want you to just read through and, and focus on here because this pretty much is going to end us right now. Um, land sauce different in composition than the oceanic. So as I just made mention, right, the ocean giving your salts and the, and the um, sulfates and then the land, dust, fire, human activity. Aerosols can travel long distances. Aerosols absorb light. And then high humidity conditions. Aerosols capture water molecules. Um, and when they actually dissolve into the water molecule, this is where we can get a haze. So you can, you can see during the summer, um, especially out in like California, they get this haze. Um, New York, um, during the summer, you can see this haze, right? So you're getting a lot of evaporation mixing in with the aerosols and you see the haze and eventually you end up seeing some smog. It's really gross. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I look out at the city. I'm like, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to breathe that stuff in. Uh, most people actually don't want to. All right, and then aerosols, along with certain gases, such as ozone, contribute to air pollution. Right, when we're talking about ozone, there, there's good ozone and there's bad ozone. Good ozone is up in the stratosphere. Bad ozone, down in here in the troposphere, don't want to go breathing that in. All right, so that is going to end today's lecture. Um, I'm shooting for a three o'clock extra help. Um, so I will put a link in Schoology for you guys to be able to use the access code and come on in. Um, I'll do that for about a half hour. And if you guys have questions, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. It'll be kind of open forum. All right. Tomorrow we will do a conference. So I, I look forward to talking to you guys again, and thank you for all your hard work this week. Have a great day.